Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're continuing uh, studying the subject of heaven uh, in this series. Uh, this is episode three in the series on heaven. So we're going to pick up where we left off, uh, beginning in chapter six of Randy Alcorn's book titled Heaven. But first, let's, uh, let me ask um, uh, the panelists just to introduce themselves and say hi to everybody. What's that? What's causing that? That's my hey. phone. My mom's trying to call me right now. Oh, okay. I thought maybe that was like the string theory coming in. Just, <laughs> like a, you know that musical instrument they call it a Jew's harp? That, that I, wish like that a were, I wish that were true. I wish that were true because it would be much more exciting than my mom trying to call me. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, you know you're live now. The whole world is hearing you. So be careful what you say care. about your mom. I don't care. Okay. okay. Uh, all right. Uh, how about uh, Brother Austin? Want to introduce yourself? Hey, man. How's everybody doing? My name is Austin. My channel's name is Austin Bell. I uh, run an online ministry called Christ Ministries, and uh, we need to do this study. I did want to share one quick thing with everybody today. I thought it was pretty cool. <clears throat> Brother Jack Smack. All credit Jesus, but Brother Jack Smack is the one who told me, and it's uh, an old school, once saved, always saved verse, and it's actually Deuteronomy 33, 3, and it says, Ye, He who loved the people, all his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet, Everyone shall receive of thy words. I just thought that was really cool. But uh, yeah, I can't wait, uh, Brother Luke. Let's do this. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Brother Austin. And next we got Brother Eric. Hi. Hey. That wasn't me. That was uh, uh, Jackson. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was my mom. <laughs> That's right. Brother uh, brother Eric here. My uh, YouTube channel is Jesus Knight 72 um, Looking forward to uh, uh, another, uh, um, you know, uh, really uh, hope-building and inspiring uh, uh, discussion about heaven tonight. Okay. Thanks for joining us, brother. Uh, next we have Brother Jackson. Hello. Uh, my name is Jackson. My YouTube channel is Mecha Wing Zero. And I've been, I, you know, I've, I'm, I'm going through kind of a difficult, stressful time as far as school is concerned. But what's really uh, helped me is the hope for the future. And this includes, of course, all the encouraging comments I've been receiving on YouTube lately. But the ultimate encouragement, the ultimate hope is what we're studying about what happens after this life. So I'm stoked for this study. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Jackson. And we've got uh, Sister Tiffany next. Hello, everyone. My name is Tiffany, and my YouTube username is TJ6. Um, I'm very excited to be on the panel tonight to talk about um, heaven. So everyone be blessed as they listen also. Okay, Sister, thanks for joining us. Uh, Tiffany, if you could turn your volume up higher, again, it's, uh, it's a little bit faint, but uh, get it up as high as you can, okay? All right, everybody. Uh, we are, we've been working our way through Randy Alcorn's book. Uh, uh, the title is, of his book is Simply Heaven. So uh, anybody who's watching this uh, uh, video, uh, we really recommend you buy that book. You can pick it up at like Walmart or Target now for probably 3 or $4.00. You can also download it on the internet free, I guess. So uh, uh, it's a great book. It's all about heaven, and these are basically uh, all the questions that we ask about heaven that are, are answered. So um, let's pick up where we left off, and I'm going to first read this quote by Amy Carmichael. I don't know who she is, but uh, for the entrance of the greater world is wide and sure. And they who see the straightness and painfulness from which they have been delivered must wonder exceedingly as they are received into those large rooms with joy and immortality. That's an interesting way of looking at uh, you know this transition from this one world to the next, and uh, this this afterlife. You know the next world, the afterlife. These are kind of words that people just in the the, the general public sees uh, uh, sees what happens after we die, but we know as Christians that uh, 
uh, after we die, we're going to go to spend eternity with our, our Savior God, Jesus Christ, and all those who love him and trust him, uh, or if those people who never put their faith in Jesus, after they die, uh, they end up going into a lake of fire, and uh, they do not have this eternal life in heaven as, as we do. So uh, we're talking about this most exciting subject, uh, what do we have to look forward to uh, in eternity in, in, uh, in heaven? So we've already covered a lot of ground now, but uh, this chapter is titled, Is the Intermediate Heaven a Physical Place? First, is there anybody who wants to attempt to kind of recap and, and explain the idea of an intermediate heaven and an eternal, the eternal heaven? Well, real briefly, I think what, what we basically discussed so far was the idea that um, the heaven that exists now is a temporary heaven until the point where God, after the millennium, actually merges uh, heaven with creation and creates a new heavens, a new earth, a new universe, a new everything, with him actually dwelling physically with his, his creation, with his people at that time and for, and for eternity. Mm-hmm. So uh, Randy Elkhorn in his book is presenting the idea, he's, he's proposing this that uh, there's a temporary heaven that, that uh, uh, the, the saved are in right now uh, and that's where if, if any of us uh, died tonight we'd go immediately into that temporary heaven but it's not the eternal heaven because uh, God is going to going to uh, a certain point in time he's going to uh, uh, destroy the, the heavens and the earth with a fire and then he's going to recreate the heavens and the earth and then we're going to have an eternal heaven actually on the earth and that will be the eternal heaven but until we reach that point we have a kind of he calls it intermediate heaven and that's what we're talking about right now uh, just trying to describe what is it like in this intermediate heaven uh, he, it says the real question is whether people being by nature both physical uh, spiritual and physical can dwell in a realm without physical properties so what do you think you think that uh, uh, you think that uh, us being physical beings uh, uh, are going to have in, in this intermediate heaven are going to have any, will there be any physical aspects to it or will it be completely a spiritual, uh, non-physical kind of existence? Well, some of the things that I know that I have um, come to understand in Christianity um, is, is regards there, when you read Revelation and you read some of the things that are uh, in eschatology about things happening in heaven while simultaneous things are happening on the earth, there are very physical things happening in heaven at that time, and we know heaven hasn't been merged with earth at that time. God hasn't brought heaven down. It's before the, it's before even the millennial kingdom. For instance, uh, for instance, the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is a very physical union of saints um, expressing love to one another. So while it's not, we know that um, the rapture is going to happen at that point. Um, before that, but. At that point, we will be physical at that point, but when you when you speak of certain things happening in heaven or they discuss things, it seems that there are very physical things going on before that happens. Mm -hmm. Let me also say I think it's absolutely essential we define what physical and what spiritual is, to be honest with you. I think that what, one of the hardest things about answering that question is does physical – we have to ask yourself, does physical mean that you can see it? Because obviously I think we will in the spiritual heaven when we go there, if we're raptured or if we die first, then we're going we're gonna to see things. Like I, I don't think it's going to be like a bunch of numbers floating around with <laughs> rainbow colors and flashing and all, all a bunch of theoretical infinity kind of equations everywhere. Well, I, I think and that's kind of what I was saying because the idea that the rapture is going to happen before heaven and earth are joined in the final heaven – you know, new heaven and new earth. Um, we receive physical bodies. The, ra the rapture bodies we're waiting for, the dead in Christ receive theirs, we receive ours. And then we're in heaven in these physical bodies. Um, if Christ is talking about homes that exist there, these places, these mansions, as the Bible says, these, um, these places, m creating these places for us before we go, I mean, it definitely insinuates something physical. I mean, there's something physical to that. Well, some of the things that we've covered in these previous episodes uh, uh, are the, is the fact that uh, 
most uh, pastors are not teaching much about heaven. Most of the church, most of the Christians, uh, don't really uh, study this out and really understand heaven very well. And some people, sadly, don't seem to even have much interest in the subject of heaven. Uh, but so the idea of in this intermediate heaven, is there going to be any kind of physical kind of existence, or is it will it going to be non-physical? Uh, that's something that a lot of people just. I think the vast majority of people would think that it's just non-physical. But we're as we go through this. Hello. Hey guys, Sorry, I'm late. Welcome, oh, Tanya. Uh, did you hear us you. talking about you earlier? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. Just well, that was in, in. The pri that was in the private time before we started the show. They're oh, saying they're hoping see. you could make it, but I didn't know. Okay, uh, Tanya, did you see any of the, the first two episodes on Heaven yet? No, I sure haven't. Okay. Well, we've covered uh, some of basic ground. Uh, right now, we're discussing the idea that Randy Alcorn is presenting in his book uh, that there, we're... When, if we died right now, we're going to go to uh, heaven, but this, this current heaven is a temporary or intermediate heaven. It's not the ultimate heaven that we will be in uh, throughout eternity. And we're trying to discuss uh, what uh, will the attributes and describe what this particular heaven will be like. And the question is, is it completely spiritual or is there any physical component to it? Uh, by the way, anybody who's watching this, uh, uh, this is Sister Tanya, Galaxy Dreams 3 is her YouTube channel, and uh, she was just able to join us. So I'm glad you can make it, Sister. So all I'm doing is we're working our way through the book, and then I read a little bit, and then we all just discuss it. So listen to this, and then tell me what you think. The, the, uh, the physical new earth will be our ultimate dwelling place. But until then, we shouldn't find it surprising if God chooses to provide a waiting place that's also physical. For us to exist as human beings, we occupy space. It seems reasonable to infer that the space we occupy would be physical. If the present intermediate heaven is a place where God, angels, and humans dwell, it makes sense that heaven would be accommodated to mankind because God needs no accommodation. We know that angels can exist in a physical world because they exist in this one, not just in heaven. In fact, angels sometimes, uh, perhaps often, take on human form. And it cites Hebrews 13.2. So he's introducing this concept for us to consider, and that is that since man is physical, we are body, mind, and spirit, and this body is physical, and that uh, why wouldn't God have uh, heaven accommodate this physical uh, quality of God of us? He doesn't have to limit it to just God is spirit, so he doesn't have to be exist in a non-physical uh, dimension. So uh, what do you think? Do you think that that is a, a valid point that uh, since man is physical, and if we're going to be in an intermediate temporary heaven, that it should be physical? We're going to go into much more great detail, but what's your reaction to that? What Bible verse is he using to say that? Was my question. Uh, well, he, the, the, the whole premise, he, he's not citing a verse on that yet. We're going to go through a lot of verses to prove this point that we're coming to. The, the, verse, the only verse I cited was the fact that the, the angels take on human form sometimes, a physical human form. Because the, the thing that's confusing to me about it is I, I always thought when we died, we don't have our physical bodies anymore, and we get those when, when, when it's resurrected on the last day yeah. and everything. Well, that's, that's going to be part of the discussion in this chapter. Uh, is, is there going to be some physical quality in the intermediate heaven? So I'll, I'll read a little more, and you can... Uh, get a better idea. If we are to draw inferences about the nature of heaven, we shouldn't derive them from the nature of God. After all, he is a one-of-a-kind being who is infinite, existing outside of space and time. Rather, we should base our deductions on the nature of humanity. It's no problem for the infinite God to dwell wherever mankind dwells. The question is, whether finite humans can exist as God does, outside of space and time. 
I'm not certain we can, but I am certain that if we can, it is only a temporary aberration that will be permanently corrected by our bodily resurrection in preparation for life on the new earth. So um, he's introducing the idea uh, for us to consider, and as I said, we go. Uh, I've read the whole book completely through, so I'm I'm, I'm kind of ahead of everybody where he's going to go with this. But he's going to show you, you a lot of uh, I think proof texts to make the case that. Uh, this intermediate heaven has some physical qualities to it. It's not uh, just a, a, a uh, non-physical dimension. So what's your first reaction to that? And what do you think that the, the church as a whole uh, thinks of that? I, I, my personal opinion is the, the church, for the greater part, doesn't really think that much about it at all. I mean, because I don't really hear right. people even discuss it. I don't hear people That's talk what about I was this at all. On last time. <laughs> it's really, and this just keeps going back to what we keep reiterating. It's it's like the, this um this lack of interest or or I don't know what it is, but this it, it, they don't even really Christians don't really talk much about it. Yeah, uh, this is just another part of the the whole subject of 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 heaven, of which there's probably a a hundred questions that we probably will be answering as we go through this study. And out of all those questions <laughs> that uh, I think are fascinating and interesting and, and, and of great uh, value for us to learn about, and yet pastors aren't talking about it, authors aren't writing about it, the church as a whole is not talking about it. So this is just one of many that we're going to go through, and that is, is there some, when people die right now, the Christians who die right now, do they have any kind of physical existence or is it all non-physical? So he goes on to say, uh, why are we so resistant to the idea that heaven could be physical? The answer, I believe, is centered in an unbiblical belief that the spirit realm is good and the material world is bad, a view I am calling uh, Christoplatonism. Uh, for a discussion on Christoplatonism's false assumptions, you can see the appendix A in, in this book. For our purposes in this chapter, I will summarize this belief that looms like a dark cloud over the common view of heaven. Now, Plato, a Greek philosopher, believed that material things, including the human body and the earth, are evil, while immaterial things, such as the soul and heaven, are good. This view is called Platonism. The Christian Church, highly influenced by Platonism through the teachings of Plato uh, around 20 BC to 50, 50 AD, um, and uh, Origen, who was uh, from 185 AD to 254 AD, among others, came to embrace the spiritual view that human spirits are better off without bodies and that heaven is a disembodied state. They rejected the notion of heaven as a physical realm and spiritualized or entirely neglected the biblical teachings of resurrected people inhabiting a resurrected earth. I yeah. frankly, what jumps out to me there is a lot of speculation, to be honest with you, in that paragraph. Well, yeah, you're, 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 I want to caution you, uh, uh, Jackson, that uh, what he's doing here is he's laying an, out an idea and then he's going to cite as we go through this over the next two hours uh, he's going to cite many uh, ways he tries to um, explain it and and um, prove it and and he will be citing many scriptures uh, Eric already brought up brought up a couple just off the top of his head uh, earlier so uh, have a little patience, yeah, it, 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 but he's only laying a, a, the foundation and asking the basic question and, and trying to present the idea, why is, is this such the predominant viewpoint in the church that, that it has to be a uh, non-physical state and that a non-physical is better than physical? And he's saying it's because of the influence of, of Plato in, right. in the thinking of the question, early church. And my question is where does he get the idea that it's from the influence of Plato, for one thing? Because for, for for like like I'm I'm very willing to uh, to change my view on this, very very willing to, but it seems to me like the natural tendency to think that would be because of all the pain that's involved in the physical realm. You know, I mean, if you if you, you if you break a bone, that's physical, and that hurts really bad. If you um you know in, in in the physical realm, we see 
all kinds of bad things happen, you know, people getting tortured and everything, whereas if everything is spiritual, all that is eliminated, it seems like. Mm -hmm. Well, this was also this was the same teaching known as Gnosticism. Gnosticism teaches the same thing that the the spiritual is good and that the physical is bad, and I guess the two are basically the same thing. Plato, I think you have to. This goes back to considering who Plato and men like him were. These were philosophers. You know, they based their they based their theories and their feelings yeah. on experiences in life. And the thing they have to remember, I think, Plato and men like him did not account for is the fact that they've never known a world without sin. So to them, everything they experience is tainted with sin. So it's hard to separate that. It's hard to imagine it because they sort of lived in the here and now experiences of life and what they what they witnessed firsthand and use these as philosophies in life. They've never experienced a world without sin. Mm -hmm. now, I'm glad I was going about to say that if if you, if you hadn't said it first, uh, re introduce the subject of Gnosticism. Uh, how many people? Uh, have heard about Gnosticism, know ba ba the basic concept of Gnosticism. Okay, well, I, I'm a little bit surprised. I thought everybody would have been a little bit familiar with it, but Gnosticism it was a big problem in the beginnings of the church too, along with uh, you know lordship salvation and other th false teachings that were coming into the church. And uh, uh, but he's he's saying that uh, rather than Gnosticism, he's using uh, Platonism because Plato and Gnosticism are really the same thing. So whether they got it from Plato or whether it was from the uh, where was it? They found the Dead Sea Scrolls, that sect of... of uh, oh, um... Uh, uh, they were the Gnostics, but there's another name for them. Uh, um, we'll think of it later, okay? Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, this is just another one of the things... You know, there was an argument whether Jesus was physically resurrected, and, and the Gnostics said, no, there was no physical resurrection, uh, because he was... Uh, uh, physical would be bad. Right. And they thought, as Plato did, that if it's physical, it's it can't be good. It's only good if it's non-physical. It sounds like it's kind of an anti-humanity sort of position. Sure, basically. Yeah, but uh, you could. Um, I can tell you that he's not going to um, uh, go into detail trying to. Uh, well, he says in Appendix A, if you get the book, uh, uh, Jackson, go to Appendix A, and he'll you, you'll find his references for uh, Plato introducing these, I mean, people drawing this from Plato. Uh, but he, he's in the, writing, the text of the book, he's not going to elaborate on that here. Um, so Christ of Platonism has had a devastating effect on our ability to understand what Scripture says about heaven, particularly about the eternal heaven, the new earth. A fine Christian man said to me, quote, this idea of having bodies and eating food and being in an earthly place, it just sounds so unspiritual. Unquote. Without knowing it, he was under the influence of Christoplatonism. Uh, if we, uh, or we could also, I think, uh, since Eric brought this up, I think we could use that interchangeably in, under the influence of Gnosticism. Uh, without knowing it, he was under the influence. Oh, if we believe, uh, even subconsciously, that bodies and the earth and material things are unspiritual, even evil then we will inevitably reject or spiritualize any biblical revelation about our bodily resurrection or the physical characteristics of the new earth. That's exactly what has happened in most Christian churches, and it's a, a large reason for our failure to come to terms with the biblical doctrine of heaven. Christoplatonism has also closed our minds to the possibility that the intermediate heaven may actually be a physical realm. If we look at scripture, however, we'll see uh, considerable evidence that the present heaven has physical properties. He's going to go into that uh, in great detail, uh, showing us scriptures to back this up. But I think, you know, everybody on the panel, we all agree that uh, there's going to be a glorified physical body that we have through eternity, and it's going to live in a physical world called the new earth, the new heavens, the new earth. And uh, we discussed that a little bit um, uh, in, in one of the previous shows. We'll go into great detail on that in future shows. Uh, but the, the thing that is surprising is that uh, people, a lot of the church understands that in the eternal heaven, they think that, uh, yeah, we'll have physical bodies, we'll have glorified physical bodies, 
uh, when I talk to any like Roman Catholic friends of mine or family that when I talk about glorified bodies and they, they, they don't they think it's like bizarre or weird ideas I've got but this is this as we know this is what the Bible says but then the question comes well what about this intermediate heaven this temporary heaven until the until we have the recreation will it be physical too and in this case it seems like this Gnosticism uh, idea has really influenced it and people think heaven right now is just spiritual so would you say that that's kind of the common viewpoint if you ask most people well what are people like in heaven right now is it, do they have bodies is is there a, any physical aspect to it don't you think they're, they're all going to say that it's no it's all spiritual I think, um, I think good it's hard because of what Eric and I have been pounding on it's hard to answer that question I think more more of the time they would just say duh and and, and <laughs> question marks above their head frankly but as of as of right now that that's what I've always thought that they're spiritual beings in heaven and the, the current heaven doesn't have anything physical and the yeah. physical aspect comes later and well, I you know, like to see as evidence for why that's not the case yeah, Jackson as, as we go through this um, you know, I, I've said this before. I, I read his this whole book uh, years ago when it first came out, uh, and and uh, I think that probably almost all of the, his premises uh, are I think are very well supported by scripture, and I probably would agree with most, maybe not all, but most of his conclusions. Uh, so I think you're in for a real treat, Jackson, because this is something that's totally foreign to your uh, your. To you now, and you're going to find out that wait a second, there, there's a lot of uh, scripture that may indicate this, but you'll have to come to your own conclusion. Right, I, right. I think that I think something for me here is this really. I don't know. It's nothing I've really ever wrestled with. This has seemed very simple to me, and I think it's a case of, especially when you deal with men like Plato and you're dealing with the people who deal with philosophy. I think it's a case of not seeing the forest for the trees. If and I think this right here crushes the argument at the heart of Platonism and Gnosticism, which is if spiritual was good and physical was bad, God would not have made us physical. And he made us good physically before the fall. There, We were not evil when we were physical. I love that point you made. That was a really, really good point. I think that's, this is the kind of thing that uh, Randy Alcorn uses a lot in the book, this kind of deductive logic. And uh, he uses a lot of scripture to back it up, but also he just kind of makes conclusions just the way Eric did right there. Okay. He says, though the idea of earth as heaven's shadow is seldom discussed, even in books on heaven, it's a concept that has biblical support. For example, the temple in heaven is filled with smoke from the glory of God. Um, Jackson, would you look up Revelation 15.8? Um, now, is this a figurative temple with figurative smoke, or is there an actual fire creating literal smoke in a real building? We're told there are scrolls in heaven, elders who have faces, martyrs who wear clothes, and even people with, quote, palm branches in their hands, unquote. Now, Austin, would you look up Revelation 7.9? He says, there are musical instruments in the intermediate heaven. Uh, Eric, would you look up Revelation 8.6? Horses coming into and out of heaven. Uh, Tanya, would you look up 2 Kings 2.11 and Revelation 19.14? And an eagle flying overhead in heaven. Uh, Tiffany, could you look up Revelation 8.13? Perhaps some of these objects are merely symbolic with no corresponding uh, physical reality. But is that true of all of them? Okay, so let's, here, here he's, uh, Jackson, you can see, here he's starting to present some uh, uh, reasons for his conclusion, and we'll have to examine them now. So let's work our way through those verses. I have uh, 7, 9. Go ahead. Okay, Revelation 7, 9 states, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Okay, so uh, could this be just spiritual? I mean, read it again and let's tr try to emphasize each word 
that you think is is descriptive of a physical uh, characteristic? After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Okay, you didn't emphasize the physical things, but I hope everybody was listening carefully. And each of those words that he, uh, in that verse, that was describing something physical, like a throne and a robe and hands and stuff, these are uh, describing a physical reality. Okay? Uh, now, uh, so whoever got the next verse ready, please read it. Uh, what was mine again? It was, re was it Revelation 5, did you say? Or... I, I didn't write your names down next to them. Uh, just uh, whatever one, uh, whoever has one ready, read it, and then we'll, through process of elimination, I'll figure out what yours was. Okay. I had the Revelation 8 6 verse, um, which is, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So here you have these are trumpets. I mean, this is a physical thing. They're preparing to sound off on these trumpets. Now, let's also keep in mind these verses here. At what point in time? Is this taking place? Is now this, 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 in, is this, this is in taking eternity? Place. No, this is during the tribulation. It, the, the eternity hasn't started, and not even the millennium has started yet. They're, they're still in the tribulation. Okay, so that would be, uh, you know, the tribulation, if the tribulation was going on right now, if we think it's going to happen sometime in the near future, then you would expect these kinds of things to be what we would observe and uh, uh, see in heaven right now, wouldn't we? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, uh, now, uh, let me see, Austin, Eric, Ray, uh, how about, Tanya, do you have one or two? I do. I got uh, Second Kings 2.11 says, As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Is that the okay. right one? Okay, yeah. Uh, now let's discuss that for a second. If you, if you remember this scene, Elijah is taken up to heaven. It's a rapture. Mm -hmm. He's alive, and he's right. taken up in, alive, just like we would be in the rapture. Uh, Elijah, and let me see, who was it? Enoch? Enoch? Enoch, these are the two people who have already been raptured. Mm -hmm. And he goes up to heaven, including the chariot. On the chariot and the horses in the chariot, they're all taken up into heaven physically. Right. Uh, okay, so if they're taken up there physically, uh, I, I don't know, is it, is it hard to, to uh, think that, that uh, they they're remain physical or were they somehow just changed and became a, a, like some uh, non-physical uh, non uh, dimension? Uh, okay, what's the next one, Tanya? Okay, the next one is Revelation 19.14 and it says, The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Okay, and uh, what's what point in time is this? Is this in eternity, or is this uh, heaven as as it would be today? I think it's. I don't know. This is at the this is at the moment of the second coming. Yeah, so, so it's this not is not eternity yet. This is okay. when I say in eternity. I'm talking about a point in time where uh, the, the, you've already had a rapture, you've already had a re resurrection, you've already had the, the great white throne judgment, and then God throws uh, the lost, uh, Hades, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the devil into the lake of fire, and then he destroys the, all the heavens and the earth, and he create, recreates a new heaven and a new earth, and the, new hev the heaven comes down and joins on the earth, uh, as the New Jerusalem on the earth. So we discussed that earlier, and we know that's going to happen. Well, before that happens, once that happens, that's we are into eternity, the eternal heaven. So what we're reading about in all these verses here is, is something that's before the eternal heaven, which would be um, fall under this subject we're discussing now, the intermediate or the temporary heaven. Okay? Uh, so now there's... Would you read that Revelation 19:14 again, Tanya? Let's let's think of these physical physical things. Okay, 19:14. Mm -hmm. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Okay. 
Okay, they're dressed in white linen, fine and clean. I mean, you know, again, he, he makes the point. He said, well, maybe we could spiritualize it. Well, if you I, want. I noticed that um, because it says um, the armies of heaven were following him, then that, that does make sense that this is before eternity because um, if it was eternity where, you know, all evil has been destroyed, there would be no need for armies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did anybody read Revelation 15.8? Uh, that I think that was the one you I gave. Think that, yeah, I think that was okay. a lot of Jackson's. Yeah. Or did Tiffany? Did, did I have Tiffany read hers yet? No, or not. I have eight and thirteen. Revelations eight thirteen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it says, "And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth." by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Okay. Uh, I really, I couldn't hear it that well, so I don't know, but was, was there, were there physical uh, mm -hmm. uh, attributes to that? Okay, let's go to uh, um, uh, Jackson's Revelation 15.8. It says, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Okay, so J Jackson, you, you get to answer the question. Is this, would you conclude that this is a description of a physical thing or a, a, a non-spiritual dimension? I think I'm going to have to go back to what I said earlier about what it depends on what spiritual and what physical are. I think the hard thing is that it's hard to say what those things are. Like I'm, I, to be honest with you, I, I'm still really not convinced that this is talking about atoms and molecules making up all of these things. Mm, okay. Um, all right. Uh, I don't. I can't see that because if you're talking about uh, smoke and a cup and a horse and a robe and all these things. These are all things that require molecules unless it's just a vision. And now if it's just a vision of these things and it doesn't really exist, it's just some kind of a non-physical uh, you know, picture, that's the question that we're trying to decide. Okay, now... But yeah. Just one thing I was going to quickly say to that is I, the way I always thought of it is that me physical matter is what makes up smoke in this world, but there may be a different thing besides atoms and molecules that make something up in a different dimension, and different things that things are constructed out of, and that's what I always okay, thought. But, was but see, what you're doing there is uh, you're kind of guilty of what you said about Randy Alcorn a few minutes ago, saying that well, where's that sounds like all a lot of speculation on his part there. Well, how, I do think, you, how do you how do you come to that conclusion? Well, what what would you base that on? Because of the fact that we're dead and our bodies are still on Earth at the time, and yet we're no. in well. Hold on, Jackson, because that's one thing I want to I want to get to you here. At this point, where these things we're talking about happen, we've been raptured and we're in heaven. Our bodies. So are raptured? In, okay. He, okay. Oh yes, okay, because, because remember the rapture. I mean, now, I, I don't know how everyone believes here, but I am definitely a pre-tribulation uh, rapturist. Okay, um, I am. Uh, so, so here, here's something to consider, and this may give you, may, may be able to open, open it up for you a little bit. Um, yeah. here, here's the thing. If God raptures us, well, um, in fact, one of the things Luke was talking about before, it mentions in the book, it mentions, uh, he mentioned Enoch, but it mentions Elijah. Um, if they're brought up physically, if we are put into physical forms, and we know our rapture bodies are physical forms, um, the dead in Christ have been raised, the living in Christ have been raised, why would God bring us into a place where we wouldn't manipulate those physical forms? He, it, he would leave us spiritual until we're brought to a point where we would become physical, and that doesn't really make much sense. We, he would bring us into a place where we could fully manipulate our physical forms there as well. So it, to, to me, it seems that physical was always the intention, which is why we receive our raptured bodies prior to ever entering heaven for the marriage supper. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the thing that I have a hard time with, though, and that, that, that all makes sense, but let's say a Christian dies tomorrow, okay? Mm -hmm. His physical remains, you know, his body, his lungs, his eyes, his lips, his nose, is still right now on, on earth. And if you bear, if you went and dig up the grave of a Christian, you're not going to find nothing there right now. Right, right. I think what Randy is insinuating is before the rapture, after death, and before the rapture, there is in like he talks about the intermediate heaven. There's an intermediate physical form. 
So so it's it's not it doesn't have the full potential our raptured bodies will have. But there's a limited physical form to at least exist in this in this physical realm that God's a very physical realm God's creating for us in heaven. Yeah. So is, is what he's I'm saying. I'm kind of with Jackson on this because I thought that we had spiritual bodies. Yeah, because because that that's the thing is what I Why I, I understand. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like I understand what you're saying up until the point where you say then it becomes physical in heaven. That's the part where where I get confused. Well, I'm ho I'm hoping then that uh, uh, as you see, the, this is your preconceived notion. And this is that this was my preconceived notion too. Before I, before I read this book here, I've heard other people talk about how we would have this physical reality in the intermediate heaven. I'm, Randy Alcorn is not the first one to write about this uh, or talk about it, and uh, and and they talked about this intermediate uh, uh, s somehow a physical temporary physical body. Now, whether you're going to end up agreeing with that or not, I don't know. But this is the beginning of the conversation, so uh -huh. we see we see where your your opinion is now, which right. is probably probably the vast majority of people would would say, yeah, I I, I think Austin and Jackson are uh, that that's what I would say. And well, let's see see what you say in an hour or two or four as I we go through this. I just have one question, just so I am getting a better understanding here. Is it what Randy's saying is that we're going to get a new flesh body in heaven? Well, we're jumping ahead. You're jumping quite a bit ahead, okay? But yeah. but you know that's all right. Yeah. Uh, the I, what we're looking at right now is um, is this intermediate heaven? Is it purely spiritual, on uh, different dimension and non-physical, or does it have any physical qualities to it? And we just saw some verses here that say before the eternal uh, state uh, that there's. All these verses seem to show, describe a, something physical: thrones, horses. Right. Uh, so, you know, you know, Luke. So something on. I just, something I just picked up on that might be part of the little confusing part for them, and this might be what's kind of throwing it through a loop for them. Um, okay. Th th now we've got the intermediate heaven that exists right now. Yes. And Randy leaves the opening, and I think Luke's aware of this too. He re leaves the opening, and I'm willing to even leave the caveat to say, when we die now, prior to the rapture, are we in some sort of spiritual? Form ourselves awaiting the rapture in a physical in a heaven with physical properties, and that's what I think. Where I think maybe the confusions happen. We're saying that heaven, being prepared as it is, is being prepared. What Randy's saying, I think, is being prepared with physical properties. It has physical properties. Now, before the rapture, we may not have all our, our physical properties yet there. We may exist as something else, you know, as spiritually. But the heaven is being prepared in a physical way because eventually we will be made physical yeah. at the rapture and I mean, then manipulate physical heaven. You know, do you see what I'm saying now? Obviously, what you're, what you're trying to do now is um, – you're you're trying to uh, defend a position too early in the in the on the topic. We need to allow more time for uh, get a little farther through this uh, and to see it. Okay, does this make sense or not? Uh, and and so just be patient, okay? Well, just, yeah, I'm, I'm well, confused. Though. Yeah, yeah, because I think that Austin and I what, what what are on the same page in that we're not trying to argue strongly for a position so much as understand what he's even proposing because I, I, it's very hard for me to understand what he even means at this point. Yeah, I know. It's, we're, we're very early on this so just uh, as I said, all I can ask is be patient and uh, as we go farther along, maybe uh, you'll be uh, persuaded uh, that there's this physical reality to this intermediate heaven. Maybe you won't but we'll, we're looking at his, uh, his arguments for it. Uh, now many commentators dismiss the possibility that that any of these passages in Revelation should be taken literally on the grounds that it is apocalyptic literature which is known for its figures of speech but the big book of Hebrews isn't apocalyptic it's epistolary it says that earthly priests quote serve as a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven uh, Jackson look up Hebrews 8 5 and if, if I give you a verse, I hope you have a pen and paper so you can write that down so that you don't forget what verse. Hebrews 8, 5, Jackson. And then it's, he says, Moses was told in building the earthly tabernacle, quote, See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. That's, I guess that's Hebrews 8, 5. If that which was built after the pattern was physical, 
might it suggest the original was also physical? That's the question. So what's the answer to that question? Does everybody understand the question? Not really. He's saying that uh, in, in, uh, Moses was told to design this tabernacle after this pattern that is, that is in heaven. It's a copy. The tabernacle is a copy of something that's in heaven. So okay. if, this, if this copy that Moses is making uh, is physical, is he, is he making a copy of something in heaven that's not physical? Or, or, or is it fair to conclude that, well, he's making a copy of something in heaven and it's a physical thing in heaven? Well, I get that. I'm confused. Though. Like when the Ark of the Covenant went up, when, when the Almighty took it from King David, I mean, it was a physical thing. But to say that God is physical while He's in heaven makes no sense because we know God's a spirit. So no, I we're mean, not talking about women. We're not talking about God. We're talking about us. We're not talking about God, and that's what Luke was saying too. in the beginning. Because we're not. We we're we're not talking of necessarily of, about even uh, us all uh, throughout this. We're, he's talking about this tabernacle. It, there, there was nothing in this last statement about God. It was talking about the tabernacle. Did Moses make a tabernacle according to very particular instructions to make a copy of this tabernacle in heaven? Uh, if, if was it a physical thing in heaven that he's copying, or was it just some like a like a non-physical uh, image of something? Okay. Well, couldn't it be asked though if something exists that it's physical even though it could be spiritual? Because you could, because you know it's there, because it's in existence. Because, because I, I, I know that someone said before, if something exists, it's actually physical to the terms that it exists. It's like the existence of law or something. So I mean, even though that it's maybe not uh, like a flesh physical, the spirit could be physical. Because you could see it. Well, listen. Uh, here's the question he asked. Everybody, just answer this to yourself. He, Randy says, if that which was built after the pattern was physical, might it suggest the original was also physical? It uh, seems like that's a jump to me. Okay, that's fine. That's, okay. that's what I would say. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I, I think what, it, rather than saying, I, I think leaving the possibility open that it was physical is one thing. Showing that it definitely was is another, if that makes sense. Well, he asked the question, so he's not saying that. He's asking you to answer the question. Mm -hmm. And you say right now it's a jump. Okay, that's your answer. Okay, now the book of Hebrews seems to say that we should see earth as a derivative realm and heaven as the source realm. If we do, we'll abandon the assumption that something existing in one realm cannot exist in the other. In fact, we'll consider it likely that what exists in one realm exists in at least some form in the other. We should stop thinking of heaven and earth as opposites and instead view them as overlapping circles that share certain commonalities. The key there is certain commonalities, I think. Mm -hmm. Because um, if, it, if it was just a parallel universe, like in Star Trek or something, that would well, mean... You know, the, I, I, I uh, haven't heard him say parallel universe, but that's an interesting idea to put it in. in uh, right, right. I'm not, trying to put, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth. At well, all. I'm saying that your your words there might be a very good uh, way of explaining it. Maybe well, it is. Maybe it is a parallel universe, and it's physical. And that's, these are the kinds of things we're trying to figure out. But again, don't try to come to a strong conclusion. I got we got hundreds of pages to go through. <laughs> Okay? Then he says, Christ, quote, went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. That's Hebrews 9.11. Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself. That's Hebrews 9.24. The earthly sanctuary was a copy of the true one in heaven. In fact, the new Jerusalem that will be brought down to the new earth is presently in the intermediate heaven. Um, Eric, would you look up Hebrews 12, 22? 
if we know that the new Jerusalem will be physically on the new earth, and we also know that it is currently in the intermediate heaven, does that not suggest that the new Jerusalem is currently physical? Now that's a good question. Would you read that, Eric? Sure. Um, but ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Okay. Uh, we'll read it again because I wasn't really following if that, that was applying. It's talk, okay. talking about this. You said it was. You said it was Hebrews twelve twenty two, right? Yes. Okay. But ye are come unto unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Okay. So it's talking about this Jerusalem that's in heaven right now. And we know that this heaven, that particular new Jer that Jerusalem that is in heaven right now, is going to come down from the sky and join on earth, and it is a physical city. So are we to assume that it only becomes a physical city when it settles on the earth? Or could you say that, well, if it's a physical city right now, that comes, and it comes down and comes to the earth? That's the question. Uh, and then he says, well, why wouldn't it be physical? Unless we start with an assumption that heaven can't be physical, it seems that this evidence would persuade us that it is indeed physical. Okay, now sticking only to this one question about the New Jerusalem, uh, how does that fit with your, your theology now? If you think that the, if this intermediate heaven has no physical qualities, then uh, what's the explanation for this new Jerusalem coming to earth and being physical? If well, similarities and um, when you say it has no physical quality, you know, I, I, I guess I would I would say similarities are not exclude are, are not is not the same as having no qualities whatsoever. For well, example, see, in, in this case though, in this case, you, if he's not uh, giving us an example that would be called a similarity, this is the actual city. That right, comes right. It's not a, it's not a similar city. I, I understand, I understand, but like for example, a molecule of H two O and a molecule of um, hydrogen peroxide it's, it's different by one oxygen molecule that doesn't mean that there's no um, similarities between the two and for example if there was some way to take uh, H2O2 and remove one oxygen molecule from it you'd have water and it'd be good to drink and everything yeah I wouldn't I wouldn't argue that your your premise here you've talked about atoms uh, several times I wouldn't argue that your your premise is, is wrong Right, I'm not even arguing. But, but, but I, but I would, I would argue, I would argue that there's no foundation for that argument. It's, it's, it's even more speculative than what you're saying that uh, Randy Alcorn's doing. Well, what I'm saying, though, I need, I need to be clear. Uh, the, 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 the thing about the reason it's speculative, though, is because Randy Alcorn is saying that there's no reason to assume that heaven is the her, or the temporary heaven is spiritual and not physical, and I'm not yet persuaded by that. I know, but you're, but the the point you're presenting is is a complete supposition that's not supported by anything. It's just a it's just a uh, uh, an idea that you have. But there's well, but nothing. Because, there's... Well, what I'm saying is, it seems to me like whether it's this explanation or another, it could definitely be explained how the spiritual goes into the physical exactly right there. That's right, all but I'm saying. I, here's here's a way. Hold on, Luke. I I think there's maybe there's a way to clarify this. Now, there's no question that when heaven and earth are joined uh, in eternity. You believe that New Jerusalem, the heavenly city, is coming down to earth. You believe it's physical, right? Correct. It's going to be physical. Okay. Correct. Would you be willing to say that before it comes down, where it exists now, it could be physical? Um, just, on a, just in a different dimension? I mean, the answer I mean, is, is yes, but the question by itself, the answer is yes. The, right. hard, the hard thing I have to say, the, the, the thing I, do, I, I need to make myself a little bit clearer probably. The thing I have a hard time with is we have this have this this um this base right here that heaven can indeed does have physical qualities, and here's the thing where I disagree is or 
sorry, I shouldn't even say disagree, where I question is a better way to put it, because obviously I haven't studied this out, and that's what we're doing right now. What I question, though, is his idea that if the if the New Jerusalem comes and it comes down to earth, and well, it came from heaven, that proves it's physical. I would I would have to say uh, no. I don't I don't think that proves anything because, for example, when you see stars in the sky, they and they only twinkle because of our atmosphere and everything. As God's bringing it down, He could well, reconfigure it into physical molecules easily. They, now they, I'm not saying I know that's true at, at all. It's just the idea that. That that um it that that proves that there's no, that, that that it is physical is where I have a hard time with. Well, your well, your prob problem is you're you're uh, suggesting that he's saying that proves it, but in, he actually says in the book he says does that not suggest that the New Jerusalem is currently physical? Okay, he's not That's saying he does not say does does right. that not prove it, prove the case? He's saying right. no, does that not suggest it? I mean, I get, I okay. That that that's a good clarification there. I mean, it, I, I I suppose it. The 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 hard time I have with suggest is I feel like it only offers that as a possibility and doesn't. Well, you know the uh, uh, the, the um, um, in a courtroom they uh, there's a legal term that talks about um, I forgot exactly what it is, but it talks about building the case uh, by adding one. Uh, piece of evidence upon another. You, you, you don't necessarily make a conclusion because one piece of evidence is so compelling. There's a preponderance the, of evidence. The, the, the quantity, the, the quantity of the of each of these arguments added together, uh, it finally convinces you. And maybe that will, or maybe it won't. Okay. Now. Um, well, well, I have a question, Luke, real quick, because maybe I can help with this a little bit. And something I thought of, and maybe the Holy Spirit's kind of inspired me to kind of say this. I don't know. Um, would it, Austin and I know you guys are both wrestling with this, and that's okay. I mean, I mean, this is again, this is kind of like suggestion right now. It's like you know, Randy's not even saying I know this for certain. He's saying is it a possibility? And I guess that's what they're only trying to ask. Would it, would it help you to accept the idea that there's physicality of heaven if you had concrete evidence right now that we know there's something that is physical that's in heaven? Well, no. yes and no. Actually, I would say no is just because I, I'm still in the thing like I don't understand why in the world we'd be put back into the flesh. I mean, once we're out of the flesh, it's done. Well, you know? it's it's not. I think he's not saying it's in the flesh as we know it. He's saying he's saying because we know we know in a flesh, but we know we are going to be in a flesh and bone body in our in rapture. Because yeah. when well, Jesus was resurrected, that's exactly what he was in a body of flesh and bone. Well, he came back, and he was, you know. Here's the thing. My response to that is, you know. My idea about the molecule analogy is just, it seems to me like an, a, a thing that easily could be, not the, something I'm trying to argue to everyone that is true. I want to make mm -hmm. that very clear. Mm -hmm. And But given, given the fact that that is a possibility or whatever, it seems to me that first, like, like, like I guess I, I don't see this something, see it as necessarily suggesting it one way or the other, to be honest with you. Like he, his point, and it's, I'm glad Luke corrected me, he isn't saying that this proves, I, 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 I'm glad he pointed that out to me, but my, my challenge is it seems to me like I have a hard time even saying that it suggests that, because of, I mean on the spot, I thought of one way and there could be other ways in which that totally transfers over and is established like that, and because that's a possibility, sure, it's possible that it's physical too. But I see that as suggesting neither, to be honest with you. Okay, let me say this: um, th this book is 476 pages long, and as we go through the book, uh, whether we're talking about this particular question or a hundred other questions that are addressed in the book. Uh, it's the same kind of a thing uh, where you may not be convinced uh, in, in, for in any of his arguments or maybe some of them or maybe most of them. I don't know. As I said, as I went through the book, uh, I felt that he presented a good case for, for almost all of his conclusions. Uh, and as we go through here, you may agree or disagree with his conclusions. But uh, that, that's, the whole book is going to be like this. Jackson, it's it's. Oh yeah, I, I, I don't mind. In fact, yeah, I'm glad. I don't think I don't think it's possible for him to prove any of the th these things, any of these questions that he is attempting to answer. It's probably not possible to prove any of them. He's of presenting course. he's presenting uh, a case for uh, certain conclusions, and then we have to decide if we agree or not. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just that we, we when we were just discussing our response to this particular thing, like I, earlier. 
he talked about suggestions that I thought, okay, yeah, that, that suggestion I do see as having some support and whatnot, whereas this one, I wrestle with finding support, if that makes sense, this isolated one right here. And I'm not saying that he needs concrete proof for everything he says or whatever. I'm just evaluating this one on a case by itself, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. He says, these verses in Hebrews suggest that God created earth in the image of heaven, just as he created mankind in his image. C.S. Lewis proposed that, quote, the hills and valleys of heaven will be to those you now experience not as a copy is to an original, nor as a substitute is to the genuine article, but as the flower to the root, or the diamond to the coal. So he's, he's saying, uh, could this earth be like a copy of heaven? I think that's very possible, on the other hand, in one sense, because I mean, there yeah. are some great, great things on this earth that's just contaminated by all the bad, if that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, that that, that I, I certainly think makes sense to me. He first says, we know that God made man in God's image. Could it also be that he made earth in heaven's image, is the question. Uh, okay. Um, and that would that would also follow with the reason there are so many bad things on earth, just like there's a lot of bad things about a person, and yet there's capacity for good, just like there are beautiful canyons yeah. and everything. Yeah, I mean, we know, I think everybody has had enough life experiences to be in awe of our cre the creation mm -hmm. of earth and the, how spectacular. Uh, yeah. and, and and even as we learn more through science and we understand more of how everything is put together, and uh, uh, it, it just it's just mind blowing this creation. Uh, so uh, this creation, uh, he's suggesting, well, if man is made in God's image, could the earth, this creation, be made in this image of of heaven? Okay, he says. Uh, why do you imagine that God patterns heaven's holy city after an earthly city, as if heaven knows nothing of community and culture and has to get its ideas from us? Isn't it more likely that the earthly realities, including cities, are derived from heavenly counterparts? I think I that's a really good I question. I don't agree with that one. Um, and my only reason for that would be because is it possible that um, different cultures are a result of us being in a fallen state? You see what I'm saying? Well, yes and no, I would say to Tanya, because on one hand, there's certainly bad things about different cultures that, that, are, um, that, that can conflict and cause war and all that stuff, but at the same time, there is, it is good to have some diversity of culture, because otherwise you wouldn't have Mexican food well, and Chinese food. And I like uh, right, exactly. Don't you think in eternity that uh, we're, there will be a culture? Couldn't you call our existence in eternity and the new heavens and new earth? And it wouldn't, couldn't it, uh, one describe that as a particular culture? Yes, and I also think that there'll be diversity in that too. I think we'll still have some different qualities there and stuff. And, and you know that this this he's saying that this New Jerusalem, why should it be a copy of an earthly city? Why aren't earthly cities copies of a heavenly city? And we we know that uh, uh, it seems like our we always we jump to the opposite conclusion. Like, well. This uh, heaven couldn't be physical; it has to be spiritual. Uh, the, the 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 new the this uh, the uh, he heavenly city is a copy of earthly cities instead of the other way around. Um, we tend to start with earth and reason up toward heaven, that, when instead we should start with heaven and reason down toward earth. It isn't merely an accommodation to our earthly familial structure, for instance, that God calls himself a father and us children. On the contrary, he created father-child relationships to display his relationship with us, just as he created human marriage to reveal the love relationship between Christ and his bride. I 
that's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems like his view of um, of of us and of Earth and of all these things is more it's what I'm going to term a mirror image kind of view. That we're we're kind of like like he when he says that we're created in God's image, which is true. That that's kind of reflected throughout the creation in general, if that makes yeah, but sense. But I don't I don't find fault in any of the examples uh, he just gave. Uh, I didn't say know. that it was fault. I'm just I'm analyzing what. Um, yeah. I, I I don't think he's so much saying mirror image as saying that the origin we need to consider origins from heaven rather than origins from earth. He's not saying mirror image necessarily that it's identical, but he's yeah. saying that. Um, things originated as ideas and as things in heaven first, and th that man got those ideas from God. So it's it's not not that God got ideas from us. That clearly makes no sense. Why would God get ideas from us? He, you know that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, yeah. we, it makes more sense to believe our imaginations. And you know, I know what Tanya was saying as far as culture. When you go into cultural beliefs, yeah, then you wind up having a problem. That's where you have issues because the cultural beliefs go away from God. They separate from the truth of God. But when you talk about culture, like you said, in the sense of food structure, buildings, um, things we design, our imaginations as far as it. I mean, that clearly imagination. You know, comes from God, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it's it's something yeah. God gifts us with. So mm -hmm. our ideas and principles would therefore come from God. Yeah. So it's reasonable to say the origins were there. Yeah. Well, to be clear, I wasn't saying mirror image in a negative way. I no, actually no. Think a better a better now that I think a little more about it. I mean, foggy reflection might be a might be a uh, better, more accurate way of describing because obviously he doesn't think that. We're both, you know, like identical twins in heaven and everything. Right, right. No, I think that's a, I think that's a good term, actually. That actually foggy reflection, because he does seem to think that they're reflected qualities, but he doesn't. He also doesn't at all suggest that it looks exactly the same. Okay. So I, I perhaps uh, you'll appreciate this next part. He, he's uh, because he uh, tries to illustrate this. He says, in my novel, Safely Home. I envision the relationship between Earth and Heaven as, compared to what we, uh, what he now beheld, the world he'd come from was a sh land of shadows, colorless and two-dimensional. This place was fresh and captivating and resonating with color and beauty. He could not only see and hear it, but feel and smell and taste it. Every hillside, every mountain, every waterfall, every frolicking animal in the fields seemed to beckon him to come join them, to come from the outside and plunge into the inside. This whole world had the feel of cool water on a blistering August afternoon. The light beckoned him to dive in with abandon, to come join the great adventure. I know what this is, Quan said. Tell me, said the carpenter. It's the substance that casts all those shadows in the other world. The circles there are copies of the spheres here. The squares there are copies of the cubes here. The triangles there are copies of the pyramids here. Earth was a flat land. This is, well, the inside is bigger than the outside, isn't it? How many dimensions are there? Far more than you have seen yet. The king said, laughing, this is the place that defines and gives meaning to all places. Lee Kwan said, I never imagined it would be like this. What was the term you used, uh, Jackson? It was kind of a similar kind of a, a simile or something that you're attempting to, to use. What about his view of, of Earth and mm -hmm. heaven? Mm -hmm. I said I said it was like I said he seems to think that Earth is kind of a foggy reflection. Foggy reflection. <laughs> well, that's basically what he was saying there. He said he, Earth is like a here on Earth we have a square and in and in heaven it's a cube. Yeah, yeah. That, that and and that that makes perfect sense to me. I wonder though, I I wonder how he goes from there. And maybe he'll explain this. Maybe he'll explain it to. Yeah, I have to. Uh, I, see, I, I'm an old man, so I, I, I'm much more patient than you young guys. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, I, it probably takes many years to acquire patience. Yeah. And, uh, maybe, so, maybe he's going to explain it. Just because, for example, we believe that God is a spirit, and we believe we're created in the image of God, and we're physical. Right. So I don't like like I think that even if you don't like I'm not convinced yet I'm not I'm not close to changing my mind but even if you don't 
can, like are not com fully convinced that heaven is the current heaven is physical or whatever. It seems like this foggy reflection uh, view that he has does seem like that could even still be consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, now the question is: Does paradise suggest a physical place? Uh, during the crucifixion, when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. That's Luke 23, 43. He was referring to the intermediate heaven. But why did he call it paradise? And what did he mean? The word paradise comes from the Persian word paradisa, meaning a, quote, wall, quote, a walled park Unquote, or enclosed garden. Unquote. It was used to describe the great walled gardens of the Persian king Cyrus's royal palaces. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Greek word for paradise is used to describe the Garden of Eden. Uh, in Genesis 2.8, Ezekiel 28.13, Later, because of the Jewish belief that God would restore Eden, paradise became the word to describe the eternal state of the righteous and, to a lesser extent, the intermediate heaven. So, uh, so far, he's... Uh, now, now, see, this is where I kind of have a problem with what he's stating here. Um, this is one of the things I had an issue with. Um, uh, he says he was referring to the present, to the present or intermediate heaven, when he said paradise. No, he wasn't. He was referring to Abraham's bosom. That's not heaven. It's it's that's a different place. It's and and I disagree with Randy Alcorn here because he hadn't ascended to the Father at that point. When the thief died on the cross with him, they went into Abraham's bosom, which was paradise, not heaven. Yeah. What is Abraham's bosom? You got it. You guys definitely got him on that one. I agree that yeah. that. Uh, uh, and we know that uh, when Jesus uh, died on the cross, he went to. Hades, and he took the uh, the Old Testament saints uh, from paradise up to to this heaven that we have now, and, right. and then in in Hades you had the torment side, and the the lost right. are still still there according to the uh, the way we understand that. Now his, now his point his point about being about paradise being physical, however, is not lost in the end of this chap part of the chapter. It, it, you can ignoring that incorrect piece there. You can still the states that the dead were in at that point. I think he still makes the point. So if, yeah. I'll let you go ahead and continue. I think that was a good catch that you made. A very good. Uh, you caught him on a on a detail. Uh, now the word paradise does not refer to wild nature but to nature under mankind's dominion. The garden or park was not left to grow entirely on its own. People brought their creativity to bear on managing, cultivating, and presenting the garden or park. Quote, the idea of a walled garden, unquote, writes Oxford professor Alistair McGrath, quote, enclosing a carefully cultivated area of exquisite plants and animals was the most powerful symbol of paradise available to the human imagination, mingling the images of the beauty of nature with the orderliness of human construction. The whole of human history uh, is thus enfolded in the subtle interplay of sorrow over a lost paradise and the hopes of its final restoration, unquote. So, um, in other words, uh, did Jesus take, when he went down to Hades, they had these two compartments, paradise and torments. Mm -hmm. did, he, did he take just the saved from paradise and take them up to this heaven, or did he take those saints and paradise itself up? Okay, uh, I, that's just a question that came to my mind. It wasn't in the book, but uh, I hadn't really thought about that. Okay, so uh, what do you think of the idea that uh, just the concept of a paradise uh, gives us, uh, we think of it in terms of uh, the way it's described here, uh, and it, all the, the physical description of it. Okay, in the, in the Judaism of the New Testament era, 
quote, the site of reopened paradise is almost without exception the earth. The belief in resurrection gave assurance that all the righteous, even those who are dead, would have a share in the reopened paradise, unquote. Paradise was not generally understood as mere allegory with a metaphorical or spiritual meaning, but as an actual physical place where God and his people lived together, surrounded by physical beauty, enjoying great pleasures and happiness. It sounds to me like he's what he's doing is uh, uh, backing up and saying, before Plato, before Gnostics put this idea in our heads, that somehow physical is bad and that it, it, it has, can't be physical because physical is bad, that before them, people were perceived paradise as being physical. And so, and now we're the people today that are suffering from that because look at the panel. I, I thought this in the past. Jackson and Austin think it now. They, it's hard for them to even conceive that this intermediate heaven could possibly be physical. But, but he's saying, before Gnosticism and Platonism entered into this, that was the viewpoint, that it was, uh, the term paradise was a physical place, not an uh, unphysical place. Well, but for me, like, the reason, I, I never, I never, you know, read up on, play, on what is it called, Platonism and Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. I just thought the reason I have a hard time with this is because if a Christian dies, their physical body is still on earth. And it it like like it's still in the grave. If I went up well, and dig up. You're, a uh, we haven't got to the body part yet. You you keep bringing this uh, body up. We are going to discuss that, but I'm trying to hold off until okay. we get there. Uh, but but so far we're talking about the phys the physical uh, reality of uh, this t uh, intermediate heaven or paradise uh, that it is has a physical uh, nature. It's not. Non-physical. There's right. land. There's trees. There's horses. Right. There's this. There's there's uh, thrones. There's uh, smoke. There's uh, all these things that are physical that you would have in a physical paradise, and that that's the way people saw it in the Old Testament, yeah. and they, all of Judaism saw it as a physical reality. Not that we they would just exist as some uh, spirit beings and a spirit spiritual dimension. Okay. Uh, Paradise was not generally understood as mere allegory with a metaphorical or spiritual meaning, but as an actual physical place where God and his people lived together, surrounded by physical beauty, enjoying great pleasures and happiness. God says, quote, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, unquote, Revelation 2.7. The same physical tree of life, that was in the Garden of Eden will one day be in the New Jerusalem on the New Earth. That's Revelation 22, 2. Now is it now it is, present tense, in the intermediate heaven. Shouldn't we assume it has the same physical properties it had in the Garden of Eden and will have in the New Jerusalem? If it doesn't, could it be called the tree of life? So there's another question for us. This tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden, that's going to be in uh, in, in eternity in the New Jerusalem. Uh, do you think it exists now? Is there no tree of life anymore? If there's if this tree of life exists in heaven today, it's a physical thing, isn't it? It, it was in the Garden of Eden. It will be in eternity future. Is there um, some? Is it definite that this is the same tree of life that was in the um, that was in the Garden of Eden? There's no other tree of life ever mentioned in scripture. That's the okay. tree of life. That's it. Interesting. I mean, Interesting. And, 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 if, you know what I think? If we accept that, if we accept that premise that it's the same one, I would say this is his strongest argument so far. Mm -hmm. Well, and and you know, I'm glad you said that, Jackson, because I was thinking the same thing. Because I mean, the, the Bible doesn't discuss another tree of life. That's the tree of life. Um, the other side of this is that I think what happens is not necessarily like you were saying that people come up and study Gnosticism and study the ways of those things. But what Luke was saying was it's been ingrained in us over such a long period of time that people have this natural inclination to say that heaven can't be physical. It has to be spiritual. And that that's just as wrong as saying 
well, it, it must be physical. I mean, it's it, you have to be willing to say, for, for me to say heaven in its state right now can't be physical, that's kind of ridiculous. I can't make that kind of... Uh, uh, assumption either. I can't say, well, it can't be. There's no reason why it can't be. Physical is not, just because it's physical doesn't make it bad. It, it just means it's oh, a yeah. physicality. You know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? It, it's a physicality yeah. that maybe I don't understand, and maybe that's something yeah. you guys could actually relate to a little better. It's possibly right. a physicality we don't really understand. What I'm saying about this passage about the tree of life, though, just to make clear, is, in my opinion, if if we, if if there really isn't any good reason to assume it's a different tree of life or a remaking of it or whatever, it's his strongest argument because when God created Adam and Eve and everything, that was definitely physical matter and everything. Right. And if this yeah. tree is still existent, you would have to assume, I guess, that he changed the molecular structure of it, which it doesn't yeah. say that he did there. So, well, I'm, so far, as this is his strongest point. See, now, uh, each person is going to react to each one of his arguments or propositions he's putting forth. And, and um, for me, I think everything he's put forth is has been reasonable in my mind. Uh, but it's not the one thing, like the tree of life or a, a one other thing, that convinces me. It's the building of the case that can, compounds itself and makes it me think that uh, his conclusions here are correct. But uh, let's go on. Uh, we are told that after the fall, God, quote, drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life, unquote. That's Genesis 3.24. It appears that Eden's paradise with the tree of life retained its identity as a physical place, but was no longer accessible to mankind. It was guarded by cherubim, who are residents of heaven, where God is, quote, enthroned between the cherubim, 2 Kings 19.15. Eden was not destroyed. What was destroyed was mankind's ability to live at Eden. There's no indication that Eden was stripped of its physicality and, and transformed into a spiritual entity. It appears to have remained just as it was, a physical paradise, removed to a realm that can't, uh, that we can't uh, gain access to, most likely the present heaven, because we know for certain that that's where the tree of life now is, Revelation 2.7. Let's read Revelation 2.7. Uh, Eric or whoever sure. finds it first, read it. Revelation 2.7. Okay. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, we talked about this earlier, <laughs> will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay. And Revelation 2.7, in the chronology of that, is before the new creation. So we would have to assume that's the state right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, the tree of life mm -hmm. is there right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And are we going to assume that the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden, which was called paradise, is existing in heaven in some non-physical state right now? That's the question. Okay. Um, God is not done with Eden. He preserved it not as a museum piece, but as a place that mankind will one day occupy again. And to a certain extent may now occupy in the intermediate heaven. Because we're told that the tree of life will be located in the New Jerusalem on both sides of a great river. Revelation, someone find Revelation 22, 2. It seems likely that the original Eden may be a great park at the center of the city. If we know the tree, uh, if we know the tree that distinguished Eden will be there, why not Eden itself? This would fit perfectly with the statement in Revelation 2.7 that the tree of life is presently in paradise. Uh, someone have the verse Revelation 22.2? Mm -hmm. okay. um, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So it's not only is it a tree, it's a, it's a massive tree. 
based on how big the river is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because well, it's a massive drain. <laughs> what, what sticks out to me that I didn't really uh, think of before is that he's given us three examples now of this tree of life. In Paradise in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, he showed us in, in uh, uh, Revelation 2.7, this tree of life is, is in uh, heaven right now, and then in 22.2, that's in eternity. This tree of life is there. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, if we know that this tree of life was physical in a physical paradise with Adam and Eve, why are we thinking that it's not physical right now in, the, in this intermediate heaven? when we know that it's going to also be physical in the eternal state, mm -hmm. why would it be physical in the beginning, physical in the end, but in the middle, it's not physical? That's the question. That's a good question. <laughs> Uh-oh, I, I meant this one. <laughs> Sorry. Well, actually, I like the class. It was a good question. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's a good question. It, you, you have to look at that and say because nothing th – there is – okay, if you look at the facts that are presented, the tree was there before. It was physical. The tree is there clearly after. It's physical. There is nothing that says anything about this tree transitioning its states or becoming something else or because it's in heaven, it's got to become spiritual first and then become physical again. There's nothing that says that. It just doesn't yeah. – it's not there. Yeah. Uh, you talk about when Jackson, when you said this was his best argument, uh, I think you're right now, and now that I've finished and we see these three uh, references to the Tree of Life, mm -hmm. and to me, it's just you logically, it's easy to logically come to this conclusion that if it was physical in the Garden of Eden and it's physical in, in the New Jerusalem in, uh, in eternity, then why, and it, and it, it is, it, it is also cited as existing now in paradise and heaven. Why were we thinking now it's not physical? If it's yeah, physical. yeah. I, I think I think the um, the circumference that you just mentioned of the points is what is what makes this the best argument. You know, yeah. whereas I think the New Jerusalem argument, it's much easier for me to imagine when it comes down to earth, its properties changing. It seems strange. <laughs> Put it through the washing machine and then the dryer. I think that uh, you know, yeah, I think that we have all, we have all, unwittingly, been influenced by Gnostics and Platonists in terms of us thinking about this uh, state of heaven today, uh, in terms of thinking, assuming that it couldn't possibly be physical now. Now I know that you guys are still holding in the back of your mind this thought about well, what are what about our resurrected bodies? Just hold that in the back because we're going to come to that eventually. But you can see now that uh, he's presenting some good cases, and, and, and it's going to compound itself. There's going to be many, many more cases that are showing us um, indications that this, thing, this state of heaven right now has these physical qualities. Now, though the rest of the earth fell under human sin, Eden was for some reason treated differently. Perhaps it had come from heaven, God's dwelling place, and it was transplanted to the earth. We don't know, but we do know this. God came to Eden to visit with Adam and Eve, Genesis 3.8, which he would no longer do after Adam and Eve were banished from the garden after the fall. Whether or not Eden was created along with the rest of the earth, clearly it was, not, it was uh, special to God. Clearly, it was special to God, and it remained special to him. The tree of life's presence in the New Jerusalem establishes that elements of Eden, as physical as the oral original, will again be part of the human experience. The presence of the tree of life in the intermediate heaven suggests that heaven, too, has physical properties and is capable of containing physical objects. Now... Here's the point that you've all been waiting for. Do people have intermediate bodies in the intermediate heaven? Okay. Unlike God and the angels, who are in essence spirits, see John 4.24, 1 
Hebrews 1.14. Human beings are by nature both spiritual and physical. Genesis 2.7. God did not create Adam as a spirit and place it inside a body. Rather, he first created a body, then breathed into it a spirit. There was never a moment when a human being existed without a body. Ne neurophysiological studies reveal an intimate connection between the body and what has historically been referred to as the soul, which includes the mind, emotions, will, intentionality, and, and capacity to worship. It appears that we are not essentially spirits who inhabit bodies but we are essentially as much physical as we are spiritual. We cannot be fully human without both a spirit and a body. There's a lot to, lot to uh, he's going to say to try to prove that point, but what's your first reaction to that? Yeah, I'm going to have to stick with, uh, I say we got spiritual bodies. I don't have any understanding of how this man even gets the idea of that, so... I'm I'm all willing to uh, hear this out, but you know, right now I'm solid concrete that I'm. Uh, I say we got spiritual bodies. Well, what is, what do you mean by spiritual bodies? What is that? Well, I just don't understand why in the world that we would be put back into the flesh. I mean, the whole reason yeah. we have the flesh anyway is to harbor the spirit, and the for him to say that we go back into the flesh is ridiculous. I mean, we don't. Unless, I would guess, like it's a super flesh, I guess, but even then, I, it would still be lacking in my mind. You know, I can't wrap around it because I know we don't get sick, we don't die, we can't feel But you, pain. well, wait a minute, but, but, but Austin, you, you, you believe the rat your body is flesh and bone. It's physical. It's a, it's a physical body, right? I say we get raptured in the flesh, but I don't say we keep it. Well, when Jesus was resurrected, was he not in flesh and bone? He was showing us what a raptured body was going to look like. He was the first of the resurrection. I think Austin, they're talking about. They're not talking about like during the rapture. They're t like the pre like the pre-tribulation or post-tribulation or whenever the rapture. They're talking about in the new earth when things come. When it talks about us having glorified bodies, is that not a reference to physicality? Is what I think they're asking. Uh, no, well, I'm, I haven't brought any of that up. Uh, uh, but I would want to ask Austin more about what he just said. Did, did, did I hear you correctly? Are you saying that when we get the resurrection bodies, we don't keep them permanently? Uh, I just I just don't see why we would keep our old flesh bodies. Well, no one said well, that. We won't. We, get, we, won't. A new, we get a new glorified body at the resurrection. Right. I thought I heard you say that once we get resurrected, we don't we don't keep that body throughout eternity. We what we describe it as that. I thought he said raptured. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, the rapture and the resurrection. That, that is the rest. The rapture and the resurrection are the same thing. The, the rapture is our resurrection. That's when we receive our resurrected bodies. Uh, well, I'm trying to get a, an answer from from Austin because I, I wanted to find out if you have a different viewpoint on this or or, or if you're just like uh, speculating something. Uh, do you think that when we're raptured? Or if I died now and then you guys got raptured and then uh, we're all uh, have these resurrected, glorified bodies, are you saying that we do not keep these glorified bodies throughout eternity, Austin? You keep, yeah, that you keep the new, you keep the whatever body, as long as no, I'm, <clears throat> no flesh, no flesh. I'm entirely, we don't keep the flesh, no entire flesh. It's all gone. We may, we might be raptured in the flesh, but it's done. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be. You're not keeping it. You know, it's going to the ground. It's going back to dust. You know, from dust we were taken back to. The I'm dust not asking. You, I'm asking you about the resurrected, glorified bodies. Are we going to have those through eternity, or somehow? Cause if if you think that we don't have it any longer, tell me where it says that we that body is discarded at some point. Does he say the resurrected, glorified bodies are flesh, or no? Because I say that we keep the yeah. resurrected. Yeah, it's the yes. same as Jesus. <laughs> yes, it's the same as Jesus' body when he's resurrected, which was physical. Yeah. I think there may was be a Jesus's gap. Was Jesus' body described as being flesh and bone after yes. 
Okay. After yeah, his resurrection. Don't you remember? Don't you remember him eating the fish with him on on the, to to show that he eat ate? Don't you remember him he, asking Thomas to touch him, see him well, touch yeah, him? He, he, he actually, about this. Wait, wait, he actually about uses that. that exact terminology. He says, "I am not a spirit. See, touch me, handle me. I am the spirit does not have flesh and bone as I do." That's yeah. after the resurrection. He's flesh yeah, and bone. I thought nobody was allowed to touch him. No, no, no. That was that was that was immediately after he hadn't ascended oh, okay. to the Father. When he tells he tells Mary not to cling to him because he hasn't ascended to the Father yet. But when he oh. comes back and they are able to handle him, which is at the time where Thomas is saying he won't believe it until he is able to put his fingers into his hand, into his sides, and his hands, the wounds. He appears and says they think you know they're seeing a ghost, and he says to them, "I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as I do. This so is his that, rapture that, body." He's that moment where he that he wasn't allowed to be touched. Was that not a physical flesh and bone body then? It was a. It was a. Pa he was passing from. It was the moment where he was passing from his time in Hades to go to ascend to the Father first before he had come back down to the disciples. So, mm -hmm. so it wasn't a physical body then at that. It was. It was a physical body. It was physical, but he but he couldn't be handled be at that point. He didn't want to be handled at that okay. point because he hadn't ascended to the Father. He wanted it nothing. Wasn't, it wasn't because it was physical that he didn't want to be handled. It was because he hadn't ascended to the Father. Right. right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. That really, what is? It's, it's a moot point. That that has no uh, uh, no effect on the the question. Right. The, right. The question. The question is, uh, the scriptures say that. Jesus has this resurrected body that's physical, and that we are going to have bodies just like that. And I'm asking Austin, uh, do you th are you saying then that when we get resurrected and get get these physical bodies, that we don't keep them through eternity, and that we uh, we we only exist as, as disembodied spirits? Uh, right now, I'll just say the best thing is I, I need to look into it more, so I won't give an answer yet. Okay. All right. Uh, let me see. Uh, where am I ne going next year? Uh, okay. So, um, given the consistent physical descriptions of the intermediate heaven and those who dwell there, it seems possible, though this is certainly debatable, that between our earthly life and our bodily resurrection, God may grant us some physical form that will allow us to function as human beings while in that unnatural state between bodies, awaiting our resurrection. Just as the intermediate state is a bridge between life and the old earth and the new earth, perhaps intermediate bodies, um, or at least a physical form of some sort, will serve as bridges between our and our resurrected bodies. Wait, let me first. That's for Brother Joseph. Uh, Hi. Well, I'm glad you could join us. We're all, we're all I know. I just joined for one second. I've been watching the whole thing. I just wanted to make one note, and then I'm getting off. Uh, Jesus Christ, came, when he ascended, he was in physical form. And when Moses and whoever, Elijah, came down to meet him, there was no... No one's saying, hey, the spirit of Moses and Elijah are here. They said they were in physical form like Christ, I assume. And if they ascended in physical form, there must be a place they go to in physical form. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and by the way, obviously, uh, Moses and Elijah are in this book. We're, we'll be coming to that soon. You guys are familiar with some other examples to make this case. So you cite these examples and, and we've yet to get there, but it's a valid point. It's a very important point. And when we, we, we at some point we're going to discuss Lazarus and the rich man and all that too. These are also very legitimate points to, to make this case. Uh, but I'm glad you could join us even if it's uh, only for part of the show. Uh, but the question here is um, He's, he's posing the idea, and you notice how he phrases this. He said, it seems possible, and then he says, though it, this is certainly debatable. So you just got to give the guy a little break here, too. He's not trying to present some of these things. He pre he's presenting as, well, I think this may be very well be the case, uh, but you know, you can debate it and decide for yourself. Uh, so he's now going to be discussing is, 
uh, okay, we, he, he thinks he's established already that this intermediate heaven has physical, material things in it. Uh, like the tree of life, like the throne, God's throne, and other things. And, uh, and now he's saying, well, what about man's body? Doesn't man need a body? Between our physical death and our resurrection, do we have some temporary physical body? And that's what he's suggest, going to say, try to suggest next. Okay, now, uh, it says, the Apostle Paul says, mean, quote, Meanwhile we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life." Unquote. That's 2 Corinthians 5, verses 2 through 4. Some take this to mean that the intermediate state is a condition of disembodied nakedness. They may well be right. Others, however, believe that Paul is longing to be with Christ. Uh, that's Philippians 1.21. But he cannot long for a state of platonic nakedness, which he considers repugnant. Thus, they understand Paul to be saying that at death we are immediately clothed by a heavenly dwelling, whether heaven itself is an intermediate form uh, in which we will await our resurrection. So is Paul talking about this... Uh, nakedness. He's, he doesn't want to be found naked, uh, not naked without a robe on or clothing, but naked as a spirit without a body. And Randy's making the point that man is physical and spiritual, and it's not natural for us to be without a body. And he uses this as an example, saying Paul seems to be complaining that he, he is saying that he doesn't want to be uh, uh, naked without a physical body. Okay, uh, there is evidence that suggests the latter position could be correct. For instance, the martyrs in heaven are described as wearing clothes. Um, Eric, would you look up Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11? Disembodied spirits don't wear clothes. Many consider the clothes purely symbolic of being covered in Christ's righteousness. Of course, they could, be, uh, could also be real clothes with symbolic meaning, just as the Ark of the Covenant had symbolic meaning, but was also a real physical object. You got that verse, Eric? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 says, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Okay, so uh, he's arguing that these people are uh, physical with physical clothes, wearing physical clothes, and Revelation six nine happens at what point in history? There's six nine the six, six nine's happening during the still during the tribulation. Yeah. Okay, so it, it's it, uh, it is uh, not in eternity yet. So, so that would mean uh, the same as we are right now. The same, this would be in this intermediate heaven stage, right? So this is a description of something, a picture of something that's happening in this intermediate stage of heaven. And it's talking about these martyrs that are, are wearing clothes. Do we not wear clothes when we're in the eternity part? Because I was just, as you're reading this, I was thinking to myself, and I'd never thought of this before, but why would we need clothes if we're in, you know, a perfected state? Because the whole reason we needed clothes in the beginning was because of sin. 
I, I can answer that, Galaxy. Uh, okay. If if I didn't have clothes, I, I would probably cause women to rest up there, and so <laughs> I we don't want sin to enter into that. heaven. But I think you were going there. On a more serious note, I think that the clothes are not necessary so much as they're like, for example, I may need to wear a shirt, but I don't have to wear a shirt like I'm wearing right now that says CSU Rams on it. I just like that design. That's sort of how I've always pictured the white garment. It's a picture of Christ's imputed righteousness on us. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with Jackson. I think I think what's implied in Revelation and what you start seeing as a pattern form is that the clothes actually have meaning. There's a meaning right. to what what right. they're like being clothed in. I could just wear a white T-shirt, but I chose to wear something with some interest of mine sure. on it. I, that's sure. how I've always pictured the heavenly garments. Yeah. As, yeah, he's he's arguing that. Uh, uh, if we take it that this uh, white robe is uh, symbolic for the righteousness of Christ, uh, why can't it at the same time be physical, just as this Ark of the Covenant was symbolic and yet it was physical? Yeah, yeah I get I'm, that. Where could. I'm at with all this is, and I'm listening and I'm being open-minded about it, but I, I look at uh, all of this, everything that's written in the Bible that that would describe spiritual things in a physical way is because, you know, that's the only way that we're able to describe things. Like, you know, I think of prophecies and the dreams and visions that the prophets had, and they were written down and described, you know, in a physical sense because that's all we know. Does that make any sense? So that's why I'm kind of having a hard time with, um, you know, I don't know. I'm just. I, 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 Tanya, I think in Revelations, there's some, there's a lot of symbol, symbolism and stuff, but there's also uh, an easy, there's also a lot of literalness that it's easy to tell what's literal. For instance, when Christ comes back during the, at the end of the tribulation, but the tribulation is not over. It says he comes in a physical form with the saints behind him. I assume we're going to be in a physical form. Also, <laughs> it says he's clothed. And it says uh, the color of what he's clothed in. It says he's got uh, his name on his sash mm -hmm. and these sort of things. And so he's coming out of the heaven that's not the, the still there during the tribulation. So it's not changed yet. And yet he's got a physical form, physical clothes, literal clothes. And so I think there, that demonstrates either he's got physicality when he comes into our dimension or he was always like that, and I, that's what I think, uh, and, and before he crosses over. Mm -hmm. I, I do like the point that Tanya brought up about uh, the need for clothing in, in eternity. Uh, without a sin nature, uh, Adam and Eve weren't wearing clothing initially, but uh, if that's the case, then I think that God will probably give us all like Adonis bodies. <laughs> you know? I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Right, I'm a Tanya. I hope so. <laughs> okay. What's that? Adonis. <laughs> Adonis. You know, beautiful, perfect physiques and figures. Right. Uh, okay, because these martyrs are also called souls in Revelation 6 9, some insist that they must be disembodied spirits. But the Greek word suki, uh, here translated soul, does not normally mean disembodied spirit. On the contrary, it is typically used of a whole person who has both body and spirit, or of animals, which are physical beings. It is used in Revelation 12, 11. Uh, Eric, could you find that for me? Revelation, uh, Revelation 12, Revelation 12 11. It is used in Revelation 12, 11 to describe the martyrs who, quote, did not love their lives uh, Suke their lives so much as to shrink from death unquote because death relates to their physical bodies not their spirits which would not die well you know I find fault with that the emphasis is more on their bodies than on their spirits according to the theological dictionary of the New Testament uh, Suke does not carry with it any clear distinction between a non corporal or corporal state the reference is not to, to a part of man that has survived death, but to the total existence of man. So he's saying that the word soul in there, it should be taken to mean uh, a person, 
a person, of which a person it consists of body, soul, and spirit, not just one part of it, a whole person. Could you read that for us, Eric? Oh, uh, the verse, Re Revelation 12, 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Yeah, so that's uh, that's the word suke, which tra also translates normally to soul. Loves not their soul or their their lives, which is body, soul, and spirit. Okay, it it appears that the apostle John had a body when he visited heaven, because he it is uh, he is said to have grasped, held, eaten, and tasted things. Uh, Eric, find Revelation ten, verse nine and ten. To assume this is all figurative language is not a restriction demanded by the text, but only by our presupposition that heaven is the physical place. Revelation 10, 9 and 10 says, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it, sh it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth, sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Randy says, it appears that the Apostle John had a body when he visited heaven. So, if he visited heaven, and he actually held and tasted and ate this book, uh, that would indicate that this is a, he, he had a physical body. And it's just all physical stuff. But the, my question is, uh, did John go to heaven, or did he have a vision of heaven? I'm not really sure about that. Does anybody know? Do you think that John actually visited heaven, or it, was this all just part of a, a vision? Okay, let's look at the Apostle Paul's account. In the Apostle Paul's account of being caught up to the intermediate heaven, which he calls the third heaven, he expresses uncertainty about whether he would had a body there or not. Quote, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. 2 Corinthians 12.3 The fact that he thought he might have a body in heaven is significant. He certainly didn't dismiss the thought as impossible as Plato would have. His uncertainty might suggest that he sensed he had a physical form in heaven that was body-like but somehow different from his earthly body. If he had been nothing but spirit in heaven, it's unlikely he would say he wasn't certain whether or not he'd had a body there. Um, do you remember when this happened with Paul? I, I think the connection here is, uh, you remember all the things that happened to Paul? He got 40 lashes three times. Uh, he got beaten with rods several times. He was shipwrecked. He was snake bitten. And then one time he was stoned and left for dead. They thought he was dead. Uh, and I think that he was dead. And this is when he had this experience, this out-of-body experience, and he went up to heaven. Uh, so I think that uh, he died and went to heaven and had this uh, this experience in heaven. But he's saying, whether in the body or not, I don't know. So Randy's making the point was, well, why would he, uh, he must have thought it was at least possible that you have a body in this intermediate heaven. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave off here. There's, we're still got a lot left to talk about just on the subject of this intermediate heaven and uh, physical bodies. Uh, I can't move on to the next uh, chapter or anything yet, but uh, let me mark it off here. And then I'll say, uh, so let's, let's have a little discussion here on what we've covered so far. Any surprises? Any... Uh, uh, any uh, strong opinions one way or another? Uh, let's start out with uh, Austin. 
Uh, yeah, I, I agree. We have a body. I just I, you know, I'm I because I go off of First uh, Corinthians 1552, and it says, "In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed." I see that we have a body, but it's a changed body. Uh, you know, and uh, during the study, maybe you know something will change, but uh, as of right now, that is uh, that's just what I'm. I'm kind of leading towards. Okay, how about Brother Eric? Well, an answer to Austin just said is um, uh, we're not actually in disagreement with you. We we agree too. We are going to have a body that's a different body. Uh, the resurrection the resurrection body is vastly different from uh, our body. Christ kind of showed us a little bit of what that body was able to do. He could appear in a place with, you know, that was closed. Uh, go from one place to another, and basically a thought. I mean, he was showing us a little bit in his resurrected body, uh, but all the same, again, he mentions this is a very physical thing that they could touch and handle. Um, to me, it makes perfect sense. It's to me, it's always made perfect sense from the point where Jesus is telling the disciples, um, "I go to prepare a place for you." And we know Jesus resurrected in a physical body. He went to go prepare that place. Why would that place not be physical if he was going to take us back to that place to enjoy that place with our with senses or a, a sense of our senses? Um, it's always made sense to me that it was going to be physical when you tie in uh, our physical resurrection that's talked about at the rapture. So. Um, that's my take on it. I, I I've always really um, kind of accepted this as 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 kind of the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I forgot, uh, Brother Austin. I forgot to give you applause. And, and, and now this this applause here is exclusively for Eric. Uh, how about Brother Jackson? Uh, in, 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 did you learn anything? Uh, I know that you don't have any. Uh, you haven't changed your mind completely on anything, but did you learn anything new? On well, I'm I'm pretty close to changing my mind about the physical thing because of the tree of life argument. I thought that was a really strong argument, stronger than the other ones there. And um, as far as the bodies thing, that's I'm still kind of struggling with that, and I'll do a little more study on that because it. I guess it. it in theory, it'd be possible for us to be spirits and yet in kind of a physical realm or whatever. Yet I kind of that that also seems kind of strange. Yet it also, at the on the other hand, seems strange that we'd get a temporary body or whatever. So, basically, my my point is just I'm really uh, impressed with his argument about the tree of life. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me let me say this before I move on that. Uh, uh, I know that uh, Jackson and Austin have have kind of been resisting some of these ideas, and that's perfectly okay. <laughs> the per whole purpose of the study on heaven is not to uh, like uh, uh, teach this as a as a conclusion that oh this is the way it is and that's that and uh, you know I'm going to persuade you. No, we're just reading his book, and everybody has to uh, interpret it and uh, come to their own conclusions. Uh, I remember when I read this book completely through years ago, uh, I was very impressed with most of his arguments, uh, not, not necessarily everything, but I think that he presented some good arguments based upon logic and scripture, and so I ended up agreeing with most of his conclusions. And I think by the time we're done, uh, you may agree with much of it or, or uh, some of it, I don't know. but. Uh, be patient, and there's a lot to discuss. It's, to me, uh, what better subject is there anyway? I, I, I think the more we know about heaven, or think we know about heaven, the happier we're going to get. Let's move to Sister Tiffany now. Sister Tiffany, are you still with us? Okay. Uh, how about Sister Tanya? Yeah, I thought this was very interesting, and... Um... I don't really have a whole lot of thought. Well, I have a whole lot of thoughts, but I'm going to, I think, keep them to myself for now, and I'm definitely um, thinking a lot about this. A very, very good subject. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to me, uh, even though this, this is really a vast subject, before I read his book, I mean, there, there were just little pieces here and there from scriptures that I thought about heaven, but uh, I had never really thought through all these things like, uh, you know, uh, 
for example, here's a question a lot of people want to know. How about their pets that they love? Will their pets be in heaven with them? Uh, and then there's like a hundred questions like that that people wonder about. And it's interesting to explore those questions because most of us haven't take, taken time to really study it out and try to come to a conclusion. And this is our opportunity to, to do that. And it's, a, it's just a, no better su subject, to, in my opinion, than, than talking about uh, our eternity. So I'm glad that you guys can all participate. And uh, I look forward to going through the rest of this with you. It's going to take a long time to get through his book. Anybody who has missed the first two episodes, I really recommend you go back uh, because a, a good basic foundation for this uh, was laid in that. And as we go through this more and more, we're going to come with, you notice how he poses a lot of questions. And he's going to continue posing one question after another for us to ponder, and then he presents his, his opinion on it. And his opinion is just like my opinion or your opinion. You know, uh, everybody has a right to an opinion, except it. Uh, there's a lot of people I met on YouTube that say we don't have a right to an opinion. <laughs> uh, but we can all uh, express our opinions and see how we end up uh, uh, conclude our conclusions. All of this will be a lot of fun. Um, let me say that if anybody's watching this and you uh, don't know how to go to heaven, if you don't know what you must do so that you can live in heaven forever, uh, then. Uh, I want to tell you right now, it's it's very simple, it's very easy. Jesus said, uh, my uh, yoke is easy, my burden is light. Uh, to go to heaven, uh, you, don't, you don't have to join a religion, become a religious person, follow a set of religious rules. You simply need to trust the person. This person is Jesus Christ. He said he is God, and he came down from heaven, and he came down from heaven for a purpose, to die for our sins, and he did. So now the problem between man and God was sin. It was a barrier. We couldn't have a relationship with God because of our sin. Jesus loved us so much, he paid for all of our sins. So sin is no longer an issue. Now we can have this relationship, but we can only do it one way, through Jesus Christ. We need to put our faith in Jesus Christ, and he'll give us eternal life. And he is able to do it. He proved it. He proved he has the power over life and death because after he died on that cross, he was buried for three days, but he raised himself from the dead to show us he indeed is God. He has the power over life and death, and he promises eternal life in heaven for all of us who put our faith in him. So all we're asking you today to do is one very simple thing. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Some of you have a lot of faith, but you putting your faith in your own ability to work your way to heaven or, or, or various religions of the world, you're putting your faith in those things. We're asking you to reject all those other things and instead put your faith in this person, Jesus Christ, who is our great Savior God. Put your complete faith and reliance on him, and he'll give you eternal life. And if you do that, um, then we're going to be celebrating all through eternity with you. And uh, if you do that, please make a comment on this video and tell us you did it, and uh, we'd love to celebrate. Okay, so I'm going to end the live broadcast now, but uh, you guys will keep talking uh, after the live broadcast is over, okay? So bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs>